chapter 11. Um, uh, Anthony and Jen, can I ask you guys a question? It would be all right if I mentioned about, you know, Michael? Okay. Uh, I'd just like to ask the church to keep Anthony and Jen's son, Michael, in prayer. Uh, he just joined the army, <laughs> and he's in boot camp right now. Wow. And uh, I, I love the military. You guys know my... Yes, amen. Our, our oldest son, Josh, that you guys saw on Christmas time, he's in the Navy. And also, our visitor friend, I know a little bit about Pierre. You're in the, the Marine Corps uh, 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 Reserves, right? Okay, in the Marine Corps Reserves as well. So we've got some military people. And, and just keep Michael in, in your prayer that he just uh, survives boot camp and he serves his country proud and as he protects us as all military people do. So, amen. Now, Luke chapter 11. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> We're going to look at a couple of verses here, starting at verse 1. All right. Amen. It is good to be saved. It's good to be in church. Luke chapter 11. We're going to start at verse 1. And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. And he said unto them, When ye pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so on earth. Give us this day, give us day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Uh, that also the Lord's Prayer is also found in Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 to 13 as well. But let's pray. Father, again, thank you for today, Lord. And Lord, just give me strength to get through this message, Lord, and let your words always be spoken. We love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, now here in Luke chapter 11 and, and also in Matthew 6, here is, is Jesus teaching his disciples how to pray. And as we kick off our first uh, Sunday of 2019, uh, our theme for 2019 is prayer. And uh, we want you to pray for 40 days, but uh, obviously God wants us and he wants his children to pray every day. But we're going to do the emphasis here for 40 days. Let's see how God moves and acts, and let's see uh, what happens at the end of the 40 days. Now, uh, by definition, what is prayer? Right, the simple definition is talking with God. All right, Prayer is our communication to the living God that we serve. Believers can pray from the heart. They can pray freely. They can pray spontaneously. You can pray in your own words. You don't have to buy a book and recite something. It's just you from the heart, one-on-one, -on -one, talking with God. Prayer should not be a chore. It should be a joy. Just as you love to talk and walk with someone special that interests you in your life, like your spouse or your children or a good friend, right? you need to build a relationship. You talk and communicate, and prayer is the same way with God. You're talking with God, you're building a, a relationship, and you're communicating with God. Prayer is not necessarily worship, but it's, it, but it's also an essential element to our Christian life. Our relationship towards God is sustained and strengthened by our prayer, as his relationship toward us is sustained by his word through his Holy Spirit. Prayer is, is very important between the believer and God. Here's how others define prayer. The Webster's 1828 Dictionary defines prayer as the act of asking for a favor, particularly with earnestness. Earnestness means, you know, being nice, sincere. God, can you please help me? Unlike, you know, God, give me, give me, want, want. <laughs> okay? The American Tract Society Bible Dictionary of 1859 defines prayer as the offering of the emotions and desires of the soul to God in the name and through the meditation, uh, mediation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It is the communion of the heart with God through the aid of the Holy Spirit, and is to the Christian the very life and soul. What some famous Christians have also said about prayer. 
Martin Luther said, prayer is a strong wall and fortress of the church. It is a goodly Christian weapon. Martin Luther also said, the fewer the words, the better the prayer. Pray and let God worry. He also said, I have so much to do that I shall spend the first three hours of his day in prayer. And we're just looking to pray, get us all to pray for one minute. All right. He also said to be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. D.L. Moody, I like this quote, and I, I like D.L. Moody. He's just, uh, he's just an old preacher from, you know, from 100, you know, back in the 1800s. He said, I'd rather be able to pray than to be a great preacher. Jesus Christ never taught his disciples how to preach, but only how to pray. Isn't that interesting? He also said, the Christian on his knees sees more than a philosopher on tiptoe. God sends no one away except those who are full of themselves. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, he said, the neglect of prayer is a grand hindrance to holiness. He also said, the souls in souls filled with love, the desire to please God is in continual prayer. Billy Graham said, uh, prayer is simply a two-way conversation between you and God. Billy Graham also said, the only time my prayer is never answered is when I'm on the golf course. <laughs> so the old man of God had a sense of humor. I know, I, I, I'm not a golfer, but I get out there twice a year, and you know, you got the putt like, you know, eight inches, and I'm like, please God, let me, let me impress these people. Big ear! <laughs> that, that's me. <laughs> All right. Uh, some other quotes, and these are anonymous but kind of common about prayer. Uh, pray today. If you have nothing else to pray for, pray for me. I need the prayer, and you need the practice. All right. Pray hardest when it's hardest to pray. And if you only use prayer when you're in trouble, you're usually in trouble. All right. A little common sense. Now let's get back to the Bible here on prayer. Uh, I'm just going to list a whole bunch of things, cross-reference it with some Bible verses. This is a simple message. But how should, how should we pray? Well, we pray through Jesus Christ. That meaning that when we're communicating with God at the end of our prayer is because Jesus Christ is our great, great mediator. It is, Lord, um, you know, ABC, through Jesus Christ, amen. Romans 1, 8 says, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. So everything we do is through Jesus Christ. How should we pray? Regularly. Yes, I think it's great that we can, you know, kind of connect to this little theme that we're doing with prayer for 40 days, and at 1 o'clock for one minute, just shut it down. You know, I'm not saying if you're driving your car, like close your eyes and pray, but at 1 o'clock, just, you can think the prayer, you can say it out loud, you can say it to yourself, but pray regularly. Daniel chapter 6, verse 10 says, Now when Daniel knew that the writings was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being opened in his chamber, Toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did a four time. Daniel prayed three times a day. Uh, that's, a good, that's a good formula, three times a day. When should we pray or how should we pray? Persistently. Paul said in Romans 1 9, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit and the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers. My prayer is, is constantly communicating with God a couple of times a day. It's being persistent, being faithful. All right? We as Christians seldom capitalize on this resource. Prayer is free. It doesn't cost a penny. It only costs your time. It only costs your heart. It's only between you and God. You don't have to come to church to pray. You don't got to go to a church to pray. You can pray anytime, anywhere. God is available. He's just looking for you. He's looking for me. All right? Sur surveys show that the average Christian prays 15 to 30 minutes a week. Okay? That's, that's, that's average. So we're looking for one minute a day. That's seven minutes. So 
you got to make up at least eight minutes to kind of fill into the average. Why do Christians spend so little time in prayer? Again, the statistics and, uh, and, and answers from this results in, in many different answers. And they are, why, why we don't pray? We're lazy. We're stubborn. We have distractions. Sometimes we don't feel close to God. And when we don't feel close to God, we don't want to communicate with Him. Some people have said uh, that, well, God didn't answer my last prayer, so why do I got to go, and go to him with another prayer? Okay? Uh, there's pride. Uh, we rely on our own strength. Uh, God, don't worry, I got this little problem here. Big Daddy, uh, uh, Big Daddy will take care of it. <laughs> I'll take, I, I got this one. And what happens? When I got this one, it's usually crash, burn, and, <laughs> and then it's, oh God, help me, help me, help me, help me, help me. <laughs> uh, there's also another, some other reasons. Faithlessness, we're embarrassed to pray. Okay? Uh, you know, sometimes I've asked different men to just pray at the end of the service. Uh, I called on a man one time. He's not here now, so I'm not going to you know, mention him. But I asked him to pray, and, and he's just like, don't ever call me to pray. I can't talk in front of people. I'm embarrassed. And I'm like, listen, I, what? no problem. I, I get it. We also have carnal Christians. They say that they're Christians, but they're backslidden, or they're in the world, and they think prayer is silly. All right? There's sin, or unconfessed sin in their lives. They don't want to talk to God about it, so they stop praying. There's an unsurrendered will. That's just something I, I'd like to kind of get into, not now, but maybe somewhere down the road this year, is talking about you know, a surrendered will versus an un unsurrendered will. When you become a born-again Christian, you know, it's not just John 3, 16, I'm in, but Lord, I surrender my life to you. What would you have me to do? Well, one of the things God would, what, would want you to have to do is to pray. Listen, God wants your prayers. He wants my prayers. He's available. He wants to communicate with you. He wants to help you. He wants to encourage you. All right? He wants your Holy, his, your, his Holy Spirit to, to, to push you to pray. All right, other reasons why we don't pray, some people just have unbelief or doubt. All right? Some other reasons, and this is, this is you know, again, from some of these surveys, we really don't care about that person or event that you want us to pray for anyway, so I'm not praying. <laughs> yeah, you know, so you go to some churches, oh, pray for brother so-and-so that's in the hospital, and meanwhile, you're sitting there saying, that brother so-and-so, the, the, the guy that yelled at me because like, he cut me in the food line, I ain't going to pray for him. <laughs> All right. Why don't we pray? Because we have a rebellious attitude, like Jonah, like Cain, who rebelled against God. Also, lastly, uh, people don't pray because they don't respect God's sovereignty. You know, like God is sovereign, he's in control, he's almighty, he's, he's God. He's, you know, and they just, they poo-poo it. All right? Jerry Falwell used to say, the only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. All right? And when you don't pray, you're not doing much. How should we pray? Continuing. By making petitions and making mention of those petitions in our prayers. Paul said in Philemon, verse 4, I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers. Um, I, I don't want to sound like a prayer critic, so don't, you know, please, I'm, you know, I'm not an expert. I, I'm a student of the Word of God like you. But the idea of that verse is like, you know, please don't pray, oh God, just bless the world and save everyone and amen. No, making mention of you, it's personal. When you pray, listen, if you guys go home today and you pray for a minute, and Lord, pr pray for the preacher. He, he's struggling with his bad teeth or pray for so-and-so <coughs> that's that battling cancer. And make that per Making mention of someone in your prayers and petitioning God. You can petition God on, on behalf of yourself you know, God, El Preach is dealing with that bad teeth issue again. Please just heal the guy. And I appreciate that. You're, you're, you're praying on behalf of me. And I, and I covet your prayers. Okay? Making mention of thee always. It's a prayer, prayer is personal. All right? Some of you have been praying for, uh, for these personal things. You have loved ones that are not saved. You have family uh, and, and friends that are not saved. Co-workers. Some of these would come to me after the message and say, 
Pastor, I've been praying for my brother or my sister for 10, 20, 30 years. Why, why isn't God answering my prayers? I, I, you know what? God works in his time. God can do something in five minutes. It may take five years. It may take 50 years. And we're going to look at how God answers prayer uh, a little bit down the message. How should, how should we pray? Uh, we should be in a submissive uh, attitude towards God. It's not just gimme, gimme, want, want. God, I need this, I need, I need this. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 10, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. It's not our will and our prayer. It's God's will and God's answer. Okay? So when we pray, to God, I've asked you for these things, but Lord, I'm going to trust whatever you answer, however you answer, I'm going to trust your will. Let your will be done. It's better to have God answer your prayer instead of us answering our prayer. Like I said, when we answer our prayer, it's usually crash and burn and we make things worse. But when God answers your prayer, it's for his will, his reason. And my Bible says all things work together for good for those that love God. Oh boy, isn't that a good promise? You love God, you keep his commandments, you do right, you petition God. God says, I'm going to help you out, I'm going to answer your prayer. <laughs> that was a good one. Come on, that was a good one. All right. How should we pray? Be submissive to his will. All right. Remember, how does God answer prayer? All right. This is Pastor Hank theology, and this is very common, but God answers prayer four different ways. He answers prayer, yes. What's an example of that? Peter walking on the water, he started to sink. He says, Jesus, save me. And Jesus didn't say, ah, you're sinking. See you later, Peter. He said, yes, I will save you. All right? He answers no. All right, what did Paul say? I've just got this thorn in my side. It's killing me. We don't know, we don't know if it was blindness or, or his wife or, or the persecution or being shipwrecked or being attacked by snakes. But there was some thorn on the side of Paul. And Paul said, God, just remove this thing, and oh boy, the mighty Paul will do something for you. And God said, no, you're going to live with that thorn. Sometimes God, sometimes God answers prayer, no. Sometimes he says, wait. What's an example of wait? Just read the book of Job. Job chapter 1, Job, this great guy, devil shows up, let me mess with him a little bit. God says, okay, chapters 2 and 3. You know, God's, uh, Job's children died. The wife died on his case. He got all the boils. His friends show up. And, uh, and then 43 chapters later, okay, wait. And then God blessed him. Gave him all, gave him, healed him, brought back everyone. Gave, so sometimes you got to wait. The other way is sometimes something better. Remember the three Hebrew children? Right? They were praying and they weren't, they weren't going to worship that statue that Nebuchadnezzar built, and what did he do? He threw those three Hebrew, Hebrew children into the fire. And what happened? The fourth man showed up, Jesus, all right, and rescued them. They didn't die. Nebuchadnezzar pulled them out, and what happened? They got promoted within the government. So something better happened to them. They were regular citizens, and next you know they're in the government. So God answers, sometimes you ask for $10, God might give you 50. That's something better. All right. Are there requirements for successful prayer? Absolutely. There are many requirements if you want to have a, a successful prayer life. Number one, have a humble heart when you pray. All right. When Solomon dedicated the temple there in, in 2 Chronicles 7.14, he said, God spoke and showed up. He says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear you from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. So Solomon completes the temple, he dedicated, dedicated, and the Lord showed up. And what did God say? If you guys humble yourselves and pray, you need to have a humble heart when you pray. Don't, you can have a, you can have a bad attitude with, with me, or with your friends, or with the boss, but, you know, don't go to God and say, oh, come on, God, are you going to do something for me? Come on! You know, don't put it on God. Have a humble heart. 
Also, pray with all your heart. Jeremiah 29, 13, And ye shall seek me and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. You pray with a humble heart, you're searching God with your heart, that's a good heart and good feelings, then God will honor that. When you pray, you got to have faith. Jesus said, what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe. That's faith. And let me just throw this in. I, I don't want to say it's gospel, but remember the four ways that, that you know, God answers prayer? That, that could be belief. You know, God, I've asked you for these things, and if you're going to say no, I respect that. If you're going to say yes, amen. If you're going to say wait, I'll, I'll wait. If it, it's something better, then praise God. But, if, but put it on God and expect God to move in your life, but also remember God's in control of the answer to your prayer. All right? Also, you got to have a, a, the right spiritual attitude. Let's turn to James chapter 5. James chapter 5, verse 16. And this is a good verse on prayer. James chapter 5, verse 16, towards the end of the New Testament there. It's having the right spiritual attitude when you pray. James chapter 5, verse 16 says, Confess your faults one to another. And pray one for another that ye may be healed. Read it here now. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Let's break it down a little bit here. That word effectual, that word effectual means producing an effect. Effectual, it produces an effect. Or the effect desired or intended. Having adequate power or force to produce the effect. You got to have a, some producing power within yourself to just pray with heart and passion and desire and say, "God, help me," and ha and have an effectual heart. Fervent. That word fervent means having or showing great warm warmth or intensity of spirit, enthusiasm, ardent, a fervent plea. It's having that that heart and passion and. God, I, please, it's getting on your knees and shedding a tear and, 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 and just opening up to the Lord fervently. And righteously means that you have a holy heart. Be careful when you're praying, when you've got sin in your life. We've all got sin in our life, but if you've got an active sin or a besetting sin and you keep messing with it and you keep... And then you're going to God and, and you're not dealing with the sin, but you're dealing with something else. Just be careful with that. All right? God wants to deal with the sin. He also wants to deal with other things. But if you're not going in with a righteous heart, then you, your prayer is not going to be effective. You want God's attention when you pray? Then you should be effectual. You should be fervent. You should have a righteous life in your prayer life, in your daily life, in your daily walk with God. Spurgeon used to say, only that which comes from our heart can get to God's heart. Right, how many people here have lost family members, lost relatives, co-workers? Are you passionately, fervently, righteously praying for them? How about you guys that are sick or have medical, is medical issues, cancer scares? Are you praying? Uh, I know privately that there's some that, that are dealing with some things. I have people outside of my life that are going through some medical issues as well, and we're praying. Um, I would hope that, that again, one day the church would grow to a point uh, where we can bring back the Wednesday night prayer meeting. Uh, we just canceled that uh, back in, I think, February or March, but we, we did it for almost eight years, and it was really low attendance, and I, I get that. But the people that would come out, I saw during, during those eight years, I saw people with cancer. I saw people with issues. I saw people in the hospital. And we prayed, and we saw, we saw God move, and we saw people healed. So we prayed. You passionately pray. All right? You know anyone in your life that's close to death? I, me and my wife have buried five close relatives in the last few years. Some of them were saved, some weren't. And if you have someone that's close to death, Maybe you want to start praying. 
Try to preach the gospel to them. What about your finances? You can pray for the Lord and ask help for finances. We've all got bills. We've got financial struggles. I'm not one of those pastors that says, well, give the church $1,000 and God's going to bless you 10 times and he's going to give you $10,000. Oh boy, I wish that would work. Because you know what? I'd be putting $1,000 in every week and I'd say, well, God, give me that 10,000% interest that you promised me. That's a good deal. Put 1000 in and get 10000 back. Be aware of those television preachers because they're just taking your money. Please, if that worked, I'd do it. And these are the same guys that says, oh, I can heal anyone. Well, let me take you to South Nassau Hospital and let's go work on a few people and see if we can do that. Some of that stuff is hocus pocus nonsense. They're nothing more than carnival actors just trying to take your money. Now, I'm not denying that God can heal and that people have to give to heal and I get that. Just be careful when there's a buck involved. Because a lot of these guys won't do anything unless there's money involved. My Bible says that a minister is not to be in the ministry for filthy lucre's sake. That means he's not in it for a buck. He's in it for the Lord. Amen. All right, thank you, Gordon. <laughs> <laughs> you can passionately pray that your car won't break down. I guess I, I gotta start praying. I gotta start praying for my teeth <laughs> that they will start praying. Well, they have done all already broke down, but we gotta we gotta stop. We gotta pray for things. Pray when you go on a trip. Pray for your children in school. Remember, God hears your prayers. Psalms 10, 17 says, Lord, thou hast heard the desire of the humble. Thou wilt prepare their heart, and that will cause thine ear to hear. Never think that God's not listening to you. Oh, God won't listen to you if you've got big sin in your life. But if you've got that fervent, fervent righteous prayer in your life, God's going to hear you. How should we pray? Being obedient to God's law. 1 John 3.22 And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. Because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Isn't that an interesting, nice verse? John says if we keep his commandments and we're living right, doing right, we're pleasing God, God's going to hear our prayers and answer our prayers. This is a promise. John says whatsoever we ask. Now, be careful with the whatsoever we ask, because we can, you know, remember, God answers yes, no, hey God, I want a Cadillac, uh, I want to win the Mega Bowls, I want a billion dollars, I want a house here, there, everywhere, you know, that, that's, you know, be careful with the, you know, the, with the whatsoever, right? Some of us are asking that, you know, I, I get that, you know. So, believe me, when I was in the police department, I'd, I'd say, God, just... You know, let me let me follow that drug dealer and put the lights on him. Let him throw out the bag of money, and let, I just happened to find it. You know, <laughs> never happened. Uh, see what happens when you ask for that that money? You're never going to get it. It's always the people that never ask. Always, and that's 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 so true. We know now. Let's get back to the message here. What a deal! Whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. What a promise. Keep his commandments. Trust him. Do good. Read his Bible. Have faithful church attendance. Pray. Love him. Be a cheerful giver. Love others. Serve others. Love his son, the, G the Lord Jesus Christ. Love his Holy Spirit. Do right. And when you pray and ask for something, God's going to turn around and say, okay, all right. You know, you can be on God's good list. Now, sadly, we mentioned this earlier about why people don't pray, but what are some hindrances to our prayer life? The Bible lists several hindrances. The, the group that I mentioned before is what people had answered, they, why they don't want to pray. But there are some hindrances to our prayer life. Here's a few of them. Again, I've mentioned this before. Unconfessed sin, probably the number one prayer killer. Psalm 66, 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. You see, if you, if you regard, if you like that sin in your life, and it's really something you shouldn't be doing, then God says, I'm not going to hear you. All right? We need to remember that God's a faithful God. We need to confess the sins. We need to live right. We need to, we need to do right. And we need to move on. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we can confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and, if we, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, not only does God forgive your sin, 
He cleans you. He makes you feel clean. He says, I've forgiven you. I've cleaned you. Now move on and don't sin anymore. we got to get a hold of that. Another hindrance in our prayer life is a lack of enthusiasm or an indifference towards uh, the Bible. All right, Proverbs 28, 9. He that turneth away his ear from the hearing of the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. You know, if you turn around and you say, ah, what the preacher's preaching, that stuff is nonsense. Ah, I don't believe in the Bible. Oh, but God help me. God says, no way. Even his prayer shall not be an abomination. He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. This is the opposite of being a Christian here, which in 1 John 3, 22 says, and whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Another hindrance to prayer is unforgiveness. All right, unforgiveness is a common hurtful thing, I, I believe, not just in the church, but in, in all of our lives. Unforgiveness, keeping a grudge. Unforgiveness in the heart of a Christian hinders prayer. A grudge, a root of bitterness, hate, are maybe blocking your answers to your prayers. Jesus said in Mark chapter 11, verse 25, and when ye stand praying, forgive. If ye have ought against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you of your trespasses. But if ye do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive you of your trespasses. Isn't that interesting? God says, hey, if you haven't forgiven brother or sister so-and-so of what they did, then I'm not going to forgive you of what you've done to me. All right, so you got to get right with, with brother so-and-so, and then you can go to God, and you get right with him. All right? Prayer in, in marriage. All right, this is important. 1 Peter 3, 7, Peter writes, Likewise, ye husbands dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as the weaker vessel, and being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. A married couple has got to be a praying couple. And if there's fighting and there's craziness and, 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 and the husbands aren't, aren't, aren't doing right, your prayer life's going to be affected. The failure to live as a godly husband has spiritual consequences. It can hinder your prayer life and can hurt your marriage. All right. Remember, it was Peter that said, Lord, how many times should we be forgiven? Seven? And no, Jesus said 70 times seven. It's got to be in, in marriage. Another hindrance to prayer is the wrong motives. When our motives are not right in prayer, our, our prayer lives have no power. James said here in James chapter 4, verse 3, ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss. All right? That word amiss means improper. Okay? Like I said before, my example, God, let me win the mega ball and give me a billion dollars and give me ten cars and five houses. God's saying, amiss, 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 amiss. I'm not going to answer it. Okay? Just be careful what you're asking God for. All right? Remember, Jesus said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Whenever you pray, it's God's will be done. All right, what's the opposite of a miss? Good, honest, right, worthy, virtuous. Psalms 34, 15, the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are open until their cry. So if you're asking right, the Lord's going to hear your prayer. I, I've probably quoted 10 different verses that says if you're doing right, living right, God's going to listen to your prayer. Right, We've got to get a hold of that. All right, the Holy Spirit will guide us towards praying right, but even sadly, that born-again, Bible-believing, blood-washed Christians can ask amiss sometimes. All right? So does this mean that whatever we ask of God, he'll give it to us, right? No, because we ask amiss sometimes. All right? We should not ask amiss. Our prayer is in God's will, meaning we'll trust God for his answers. 
Just some concluding thoughts here. We've got communion. It's winding down here. Have we prayed for, and fill in the blank, have we prayed for our enemies? Jesus said in, in, in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 44, but I say to you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. For those that hate you, you should be praying for them. All right? Pray that we don't enter in temptation. Jesus said in Matthew 26, 41, Watch and pray that ye enter not in temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. That's one of those like things that I put in our 40-day prayer list. All right, we may have you know, sin or temptation. God knows, I mean, the devil, well, God knows too, but the devil knows what you like in your sin life. He, he knows that you like to do this or do that and it's not right. And he's going to tempt you. Jesus says, pray that you don't get tempted. All right? Have we prayed for our lost ones? All right? Paul did. He said in Romans 10, 11, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. He prayed for an entire nation. Have you prayed for the government? I, uh, Paul said in, in 1 Timothy 2, I exert first, therefore, first of all, supplication, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for that all that are in authority. Have we prayed for the, the pastor and church leadership? Right, Hebrews 13, 17, and 18, one of the pastor's favorite you know, Bible verses here. Obey them that have rule over you and submit yourselves. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> for they watch over your souls that they might give an account that they may do it with joy, not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Pray for us. For we trust and we have a good conscience in all things, willing to live honestly. You need to pray for the church, pray for church leadership. All right? Have we prayed for our church that God will send workers for the church? Jesus said in Matthew 9, uh, 38, Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. All right? Amen. I'm going to... I'm going to close it out. I got a couple pages, but maybe, you know, this is going to be a two or three week message here on prayer. But lots to pray about and how to pray about and how to do right and, and prayer. And it's my prayer that church will get a hold of prayer for 2019. We'll kind of follow this little 40 day thing. We're going to see how God moves in action in our lives. We'll have a nice testimony time. And we're going to, we're going to pray. All right, so let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. Lord, thank you for the message. And Lord, that's just my prayer. And I want to start this year off right by praying. I pray for each and every one in this church, Lord, that you'll bless them, Lord, uh, with health and with finances and with peace, that inner peace. Uh, and they'll have joy and love and compassion in their lives. Lord, just bless them. Thank you, thank you for their faithfulness for coming each and every week and supporting a small church here. And Lord, it's my prayer, Lord, that we'll see uh, a little growth this year, Lord, and you would always add to the church as you see fit daily, Lord. And Lord, we just pray for church growth that we can be uh, this church here in, in the uh, South Shore of Nassau County. Lord, we just love you. We bless you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. I'm going to ask the men if you guys can come forward. And we're going to have communion. The Lord's Supper. Let me just turn off my good camera.